In the past 100 years, the world has undergone more change than in the past 100 centuries. Scientific research plays a role of utmost importance. Which country contributed the most to the world's science development in the past 100 years? Whether you like it or not, the answer is the United States. The U.S. attracted the most brilliant brains from every corner of the earth and built the modern world on science. Which country will contribute the most to the world's science development in the next 100 years, then? There is no correct answer to the above question yet. Kindly post your answers in the comments for others to consider. Hi everyone, welcome back to Difference Frames the World, a channel for discussing global events from a unique perspective. Today, Clara would like to go through the academic engagement and rivalry between China and the United States, which few people notice beyond the chip or trade war between the two nations. The future of global power does not merely lie in the number of armies, trade wars, or diplomatic summits. We should look instead at university laboratories, graduate seminars, research conferences, and the papers published in scientific journals. For decades, these academic spaces have been where the United States and China met most intensely, not as rivals shouting across borders, but as collaborators working side by side. Today, the once collaborative arenas of academic engagement between the US and China have become places of tension, uncertainty, and reassessment. Such a dramatic change highlights how the relationship between the two countries in higher education changed from an optimistic partnership to cautious competition. It explains why the idea of decoupling, which means the separation of their academic and scientific ties, has become so important right now. In today's episode, we need to know what China or the US offers the academic world, where they face challenges, and what the future may hold if science continues to be influenced by global politics, particularly the tension between Beijing and Washington. Let us start with the rise of America and China's academic engagement. We need to admit that the modern era of US-China academic cooperation began with optimism. When diplomatic relations were normalized in the late 1970s, science and education were seen as neutral ground, domains where politics could step back and shared human curiosity could step forward. Academic exchanges became symbols of trust and tools of modernization. At that time, the US and China had a common threat from the former Soviet Union. As a result, the 1980s witnessed the honeymoon of US-China relations. Chinese people today still love President Reagan and regard him as one of the greatest leaders. There are well-known photos from that visit showing Reagan dressed very casually by diplomatic standards, blue jeans, a leather jacket, and even a cowboy hat at one point. The outfit was intentional. Reagan wanted to project a relaxed, unmistakably American image rather than formal state attire. At the time, that stood out for a few reasons. Western casual clothing, especially jeans, was still relatively rare and symbolic in China. Reagan's style contrasted sharply with the more formal suits or Chairman Mao-style jackets typical of earlier diplomatic visits. It reinforced his personal brand, approachable, confident, and rooted in American culture. Reagan also outshined most world leaders with his unmatched humor. His political joke about three dogs, from the US, the Soviet Union and Poland, is still hilarious today. American dog knows if he barks, someone will give him meat, the Polish dog asks what is meat, and the Russian dog asks what is bark. Reagan's visit has become one of the most memorable visual moments in the history of China-US friendship, which one can hardly find nowadays. If we say President Reagan buried the former Soviet Union, that is too exaggerated. However, if we say he attracted hundreds of thousands of Chinese students, scholars and researchers to the United States, no one should challenge us. For China, academic engagement with the United States served as a gateway to the global knowledge system. Chinese students, scholars, and scientists traveled to American universities to study cutting-edge research methods, institutional practices, and disciplinary cultures. For the United States, collaboration with China offered access to an enormous talent pool, vast datasets, and the chance to integrate a rising power into international scientific norms. Over time, the relationship deepened. Joint research centers were established. Thousands of co-authored papers appeared annually. Chinese students became one of the largest international student populations in the United States, 
particularly in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Laboratories in physics, chemistry, medicine, and engineering became multilingual, multicultural environments where collaboration was routine. For many years, this engagement was framed as a win-win arrangement. Scientific progress accelerated. Universities expanded their global reach. Innovation ecosystems flourished. Few imagined that academic exchange itself would one day be treated as a strategic vulnerability for the United States, especially during Donald Trump's first and second terms. The tone began to shift as China's capabilities grew. What once looked like knowledge sharing started to look, from some perspectives, like knowledge leakage. As China invested heavily in research and development, built world-class universities, and rapidly expanded its scientific output, policymakers in Washington began asking difficult questions. Was academic openness inadvertently strengthening a strategic competitor? Were U.S. taxpayer-funded research programs benefiting Chinese military or industrial goals? Could universities continue to function as neutral spaces in a world of great power rivalry? These concerns intensified as technology became more central to national security. Fields like artificial intelligence, quantum computing, nuclear energy, biotechnology, and advanced materials research were no longer just academic disciplines. Instead, they were and are still becoming pillars of strategic power. The boundaries between civilian and military research blurred, especially in systems where the state plays a strong coordinating role. As a result, academic cooperation began to be reframed through a security lens. Congressional reports, policy reviews, and media investigations highlighted cases where collaborative research intersected with sensitive technologies. The assumption that science naturally transcends politics started to erode. Scientists have nationalities, and science has eventually been put into boundaries. Then came the concept of decoupling. Decoupling is often discussed in economic terms, such as supply chains, manufacturing, and trade. But academic decoupling is equally significant and in some ways, more complex. Knowledge does not move like goods. It flows through people, in the form of ideas, institutions, and norms. Academic decoupling does not mean a complete severing of ties. Rather, it refers to a gradual process of disengagement, fewer joint projects, stricter visa controls, reduced data sharing, heightened scrutiny of funding sources, and the quiet withdrawal from partnerships deemed risky. This process has long begun. Some universities have paused or terminated collaborations. Funding agencies have tightened disclosure requirements. Researchers face new compliance burdens. Scholars worry that innocent professional connections may be misinterpreted. The impact is subtle but cumulative. Collaboration becomes slower, more bureaucratic and more fragile. Trust erodes not through dramatic ruptures but through everyday friction. The most notorious act is the Wolf Amendment, which we discussed many times in previous videos. The decoupling has greatly affected the two nations and the rest of the world. Because of the decoupling, China has realized self-reliance on most fronts as one of the most developed technological powers in the world, if not the only one. It has beaten the United States across many key metrics. Also, the US suffers a lot from the decoupling. The human cost of academic rivalry is too high for it to bear, to some extent. One of the most underappreciated aspects of academic decoupling is its effect on people. Academic systems are built on trust, mobility, and openness. When those foundations weaken, the consequences ripple outward. Chinese scholars working in the United States have reported increased anxiety about surveillance, scrutiny, and suspicion. Some feel caught between loyalty to their host institutions and their country of origin. Others worry that geopolitical tensions beyond their control may limit their career prospects. At the same time, American researchers lose access to collaborators, data, and perspectives that once enriched their work. Graduate students find fewer opportunities for international fieldwork or joint supervision. Early career researchers, who rely heavily on global networks, are particularly vulnerable. When the International Space Station retires a few years later, American astronauts will have no place to go in space, as the Chinese side has not admitted Americans to its space station, Tiangong. 
The Wolf Amendment was initially introduced to curb China's space development, but it has now become an obstacle to America's own space research. How ironical is that? The result of academic rivalry is a chilling effect. Even when collaboration remains legal and encouraged, fear and uncertainty discourage initiative. Scientists begin to self-censor, not in what they say, but in whom they work with. Before going any further, let us compare academic strengths and weaknesses of the two countries. The United States remains the world's most influential academic power. Its strengths are deep, structural, and resilient. American universities dominate global rankings not just because of funding, but because of institutional diversity and academic freedom. The U.S. system encourages intellectual risk-taking, interdisciplinary experimentation, and bottom-up innovation. Faculty often have significant autonomy to pursue unconventional ideas. The United States also excels in fundamental research, which may not yield immediate applications, but lays the groundwork for future breakthroughs. Many transformative technologies emerged from curiosity-driven research conducted decades earlier. Another critical strength is talent attraction. For much of the modern era, the United States has been the destination of choice for ambitious students and scholars from around the world. This influx has continually refreshed the academic workforce and fueled innovation. Yet the U.S. system is not without weaknesses. Funding can be volatile and politicized. Inequality between elite institutions and less-resourced universities is growing. Bureaucratic pressures and commercialization can distort research priorities. An increasing suspicion toward international collaboration risks undermining one of America's greatest advantages, openness. Another disadvantage is fatal to the U.S. The country does not have a full industrial base like China, so its academic power cannot transform into technological breakthroughs as the Chinese labs do. In contrast, China is the only country that possesses a full set of industries in the world, so the application of new ideas, technologies and researches is unmatched by other players, including the US. China's academic rise has been one of the most dramatic transformations in modern history. In just a few decades, it has moved from the periphery of global science to its center. The Chinese system excels at scale and coordination. Massive investments in infrastructure, talent recruitment, and strategic fields have produced rapid gains in output. Chinese universities now publish enormous volumes of research and file vast numbers of patents. In 2024, China filed over 49% of the world's total patents, three times the US, which ranked the second. China is particularly strong in applied research and engineering, as we said earlier. Close ties among universities, state agencies, and industry enhance its ability to move from the laboratory to industrial applications. Large datasets, manufacturing capacity, and policy alignment accelerate this process. However, China's academic system also faces constraints. Centralized governance can limit intellectual freedom and discourage dissenting ideas. Evaluation systems that emphasize quantity over quality may incentivize incremental rather than transformative research. International trust can be harder to build when transparency is questioned. Piracy is also a major problem, and many professors have even been found stealing from their students. China's challenge is not capability, but credibility. As it becomes a leading producer of knowledge, it must also become a leading steward of academic norms. The US and China are rivals in many senses, but their interdependence beneath the rivalry cannot be overstated. Despite the rhetoric of decoupling, the academic systems of the United States and China remain deeply intertwined. Many of the most influential scientific papers of the past two decades have been co-authored by researchers from both countries. Laboratories have been built on long-standing personal relationships that do not dissolve easily. Such interdependence is not accidental. Modern science is global by nature. No single country, however powerful, can dominate every field. Climate change, pandemics, energy transitions, and space exploration all require shared knowledge and collective effort. The danger of academic decoupling is not just that it slows progress, but that it fragments the global scientific ecosystem. When knowledge flows are disrupted, duplication increases, 
trust decreases, and innovation becomes less efficient. Ironically, attempts to weaken a competitor through academic isolation may end up weakening itself and strengthening the rival. As we said earlier in a previous video, Chinese astronauts stayed in space for merely several days after space debris hit their return capsule. In contrast, the US astronauts had to stay in orbit for nearly a year, even though they were supposed to return to Earth in days. Here enters the role of national security, as none of the points we mentioned just now is to deny legitimate security concerns. Some research is sensitive. Some technologies have dual-use potential. Governments have a responsibility to protect national interests. The challenge lies in precision. Broad restrictions risk sweeping in harmless collaboration along with genuinely risky projects. Oversecuritization can turn universities into extensions of the national security state, undermining their core mission. A more sustainable approach distinguishes between fields, institutions, and contexts. It recognizes that not all collaboration is equal and that blanket suspicion is neither fair nor effective. Academic engagement does not require naivety. But it does require proportionality. Looking ahead, the future of US-China academic relations is unlikely to be defined by either full engagement or total separation. Instead, it will be shaped by selective cooperation, managed competition, and ongoing tension. Some fields, such as public health, climate science, and basic mathematics, are likely to remain relatively open. Others, especially those tied to defense and strategic technologies, will face increasing restrictions. Universities will become more cautious, more compliant, and more strategic in their partner selection. Individual researchers will bear greater responsibility for navigating complex ethical and political terrains. At the same time, new forms of engagement may emerge. Multilateral collaborations involving third countries may offset bilateral tensions. Digital platforms may enable indirect cooperation even as physical mobility declines. The biggest risk is normalization of distrust. If academic rivalry becomes the default mindset, the world may enter an era where science is permanently fractured along geopolitical lines. At its core, the question of US-China academic engagement is not just about power. Instead, it is about values. What kind of global knowledge system do we want? One defined by walls and suspicion, or one shaped by cautious but genuine cooperation? History suggests that scientific progress thrives in openness, even amid rivalry. The Cold War, after all, did not prevent collaboration in space exploration or public health. But it required deliberate effort to keep channels open. Actually, the former Soviet Union and the United States accelerated their research across most fronts due to academic rivalry. Without the pressure from the Soviets, President Kennedy would not have launched the Moon Project, even if some doubt that Hollywood, not NASA, led the project. The relationship between the United States and China is like that between the USSR and the USA, but it is not simply a contest to be won. It is a shared responsibility to manage competition without destroying the foundations of knowledge itself. In the end, laboratories, classrooms, and research communities matter as much as diplomats and generals. The choices made today about academic engagement or disengagement will echo for decades, not just in who leads the world, but in whether the world continues to learn together at all. Now answer the question we raised at the beginning, which country will contribute the most to the science development in the coming 100 years? It does not have to be China. It can also be India, Japan, Germany and the United States.